Thanks very much, Randy. Um, it's great to see this, this huge turnout today. And I'm here to remind everyone that mammals can be fossils too. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about, uh, I work mostly in Africa, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of human impacts on Africa's faunas. That's mine, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, before I go any further though, um, what I'm about to present is, uh, draws from a, some collaborative work with some friends and colleagues of mine, uh, John Rowan at University of Massachusetts, Andrew Dew just over the the mountains over there at Colorado State, and Paul Koch is at UC Santa Cruz, and smiling kind of halfway because he's a dean, and, and that's as much as you can smile if you're a dean. <laughs> um, so yeah, Antoine did set the stage very nicely uh, with the end of his talk. Um, this is something we're all aware of. Human impacts on contemporary ecosystems are, are pervasive. They're widespread. Uh, we are transforming Earth's landscapes. Uh, we are changing its climate, we are influencing biotic systems, we're changing the plants and animals around us. And again, Antoine uh, showed some of that. Um, and it's getting to the point where geologists, archaeologists, other scientists have started debating um, whether we should uh, you know, recognize an, a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. Um, and whether, you know, where you want to place the anth Anthropocene in time doesn't really matter to me so much, but it's symbolic of awareness of how much we've been transforming the natural world. And uh, I, I really um, spend a lot of time working on fossil mammals, so that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, but, but our impacts on the natural world, they are widespread, they affect many different types of systems. And in terms of animal life, um, large mammals have been having a really rough go of it uh, in, in the last few hundred years. Um, they, are, they are preferentially affected by human impacts. And, and this, this makes sense to us, but just to give you an example there, I have some uh, figures from the World Conservation Union. Um, you go back to 1927, it's estimated there are about 10 million elephants in Africa. Today we have uh, about 450,000, so just in a, a little bit longer than one average human lifespan, um, elephant diversity has, has plummeted, or elephant populations have plummeted across Africa, and that is uh, largely due to human impacts, habitat loss, uh, poaching, hunting, um, and, and related factors. And it's, it's to the point, so elephants is one example, we could think of many others, um, that uh, you know, the human impacts on large mammals is, is going to be one of the uh, hallmarks of human activity on the natural world in the 21st century. Um, and it's really changing the way ecosystems are working and functioning in the present. Now, for those of us who work in the past, maybe not as deep in time as what we've been hearing about today, uh, but this is kind of the same old story. Um, those of us archaeologists, geologists, paleontologists who work in the last 100,000 years or so um, know that this is really nothing new. Um, human impacts have been around for a long time. The question is just how deep in time. Um, and one debate that's very well known and has received a lot of attention concerns uh, the demise of Earth's megafauna. Uh, big animals, bigger than about 100 pounds or so, across the continents in the last 100,000 years or so. And there is uh, you know, increasingly compelling evidence to suggest that human impacts, uh, either alone or, or synergistically with climate change, probably played a very important role in extinctions of large mammals across the globe. Uh, the short story is that, um, well, our, our species, Homo sapiens, we emerge in Africa 200 to 300,000 years ago. Uh, we start dispersing in a big way after about 100,000 years ago and begin our colonization across the globe. And in the midst of that process, the planet loses about two-thirds of its large mammal species. Um, more than 72% in North America, for example. So, you know, if you were here 15,000 years ago, you'd see mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, American lions, uh, things that look like cheetahs, camels, horses, llamas, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, these extinctions happen in different times and different places, uh, but the one common, the, there are two big common denominators. One is it happens shortly after people show up, and two, uh, it preferentially affected uh, the biggest critters, and that's sort of unique. It's in fact unique for the entire Cenozoic, the last 65 million years, this bias, uh, preferential loss of large mammals, things that people might like to be hunting and um, are, uh, is, is unparalleled in, throughout mammalian history. Um, so that suggests to many people that uh, humans did play a very fundamental role in these more recent extinctions in the last 
100,000 years or so. Um, but there is an increased uh, attention to whether human impacts could be much older than Homo sapiens. Um, and this has sort of quietly happened, but it's ramping up. Um, there's actually something just, just in the news, a, a piece of science that came out and was, uh, received a good bit of attention, suggesting human impacts on Africa's carnivores going back millions of years. Um, so this is increasingly happening. Um, ecologists and conservation biologists are starting to pay attention, um, but it needs a bit more attention. And in terms of the African record, uh, everyone thinks you know, Africa still does have very diverse megafauna, and that's true. Uh, but if you went back in time uh, four, four to six million years ago, for example, um, its large mammal diversity was even more incredible than what we have today. And that's especially true of the mega herbivores. These are animals that are bigger than about 1,000 kilograms. So in Africa today, that includes uh, elephants, hippos, black rhinos, white rhinos, and giraffes. Uh, so there are five species of mega herbivore in Africa today. We call them mega herbivores. We give them their own name because they're actually really uh, fundamental uh, players in ecosystems. They, they are, are, are crucial to influencing vegetation structure, fire regimes, seed dispersal. Um, so the presence or absence of mega herbivores really can change the landscape. Um, but you, you go back in time, four or six million years ago, you might see uh, a dozen mega herbivore species living side by side by side, multiple species of elephants, uh, multiple different types of giraffes, for example, things like calicoth ears, that's in the upper middle there, which doesn't really have a good uh, living analog today, gigantic buffaloes. Um, so there's some question, you know, what happened? Uh, what happened in Africa? And uh, increasingly, some people are suggesting that this has uh, something to do with our human ancestors. Homo erectus, in particular, gets a lot of the blame here. I'm, I'm picking on my colleague, Kate Lyons, here by pulling a quote from her, um, which I'm allowed to do because Antoine and I actually uh, both collaborate with her a bit, so it's okay to pick on your friends. Um, <laughs> but she suggests uh, in a paper from 2004 that uh, uh, she implicates Homo erectus in the extinction of Africa's mega herbivores, um, noting that at the time human be humans began developing relatively complex societies around the time of Homo erectus, which appears in Africa about two million years ago. Uh, there were 12 species of elephant-like animals in Africa, and by the middle Pleistocene, that's about 780,000 years ago, a um, little more than a million years after Homo erectus shows up, only two remain. And um, those ideas have been catching on. And, and there is some reason to believe that Homo erectus could have potential to be driving extinctions in Africa. Uh, in terms of human evolutionary history, uh, Homo erectus shows up about two million years ago, but is the first of our hominin ancestors that is uh, more rec recognizably human. Uh, is an obligate biped, walking around on two legs all the time, no longer in the trees. Australopithecus, for example, uh, a, a hominin ancestor that many people will be familiar with, probably spent quite a bit of time in the trees still, was still bipedal as well. Um, but we see changes in the archaeology around the same time that Homo erectus shows up. Um, we see a, a really big increase in the number of archaeological sites uh, with evidence of, of animal predation, uh, butchery sites. And that includes butchery of animals like mega herbivores. So things are changing uh, in an important way when Homo erectus shows up. Um, and increasingly, the last few years have been these widespread claims for ancient hominin impacts dating back about two million years um, to the time of Homo erectus. Um, and it's, it's, it's happening in, in high-profile papers, uh, and it's sort of, it's, it's catching on, and, and in, in some circles it's sort of becoming gospel. Uh, but the funny thing is, I mean, there are suggestions like this, hey, there used to be a lot of elephants, there aren't so many anymore, what happened, maybe Homo erectus, uh, but there's been relatively few attempts to test them. Um, hey, dude, go sit, or you can hang out. Um, there have been relatively few attempts to test these ancient impacts hypotheses, so that's what I'm going to present here today. Um, and in terms of, of, you know, did Homo erectus play a role in the demise of Africa's mega herbivores, um, our test predictions are fairly simple. Um, one might expect, if we look at mega herbivore diversity through time, to see a sudden drop off when Homo erectus shows up around two million years ago. Um, on the other hand, if environmental changes are responsible, perhaps we might see a more steady long-term shift that is perhaps tracking climate-driven environmental changes. And uh, we can you know, test some of these ideas. The place to do it is Eastern Africa. That's where I do a lot of my field work. Um, though this isn't based on my field work alone. This is based on decades of field work. 
uh, by many teams uh, for, for quite some time. Um, and so my colleagues and I, we compiled a database of Eastern African fossil sites spanning the last seven million years. And that encompasses the entirety of human evolutionary history. So if humans are doing something to African mega herbivores, we should be able to see it. So we looked at uh, mega herbivore diversity through time uh, using that sample. And what we see is the uh, Eastern African mega herbivores have declined through time. We already kind of knew that. Uh, what we didn't know is really the pattern and timing of that decline. Um, and so this, this figure here, each dot there is a different site in Eastern Africa. Um, and we see this trend, this long-term, steady, gradual decline. Um, I should note it's, it's a measure of the number of species. Don't worry about the negative numbers. We have to correct for uh, various sampling issues in the, in the fossil record. Um, but the trend is what's important. And we see this long-term decline. And importantly, it begins well before two million years ago when Homo erectus shows up. Um, our best estimate using some uh, statistical tricks is about four and a half million years is when the onset of the decline takes place. And if we are to um, put that in the timeline of human evolutionary history, um, well, a, a few things worth noting. Uh, our species, Homo sapiens, kicks in at 300,000 years. The decline's almost over by the time we show up. Um, projectile technology shows up about the same time as our species, 300,000 years, give or take. Um, again, the mega herbivore decline is, is almost over by then. Homo erectus appears at two million years, um, but that's two and a half million years too late. The mega herbivores have been in a long-term decline. And in fact, the hominin species sort of associated in time with this mega herbivore decline are, are critters like Australopithecus. Artipithecus is, is uh, uh, temporal range is about four, four and a half to five and a half million years or thereabouts. Um, and Artipithecus is our hominin ancestor who's on the scene when mega herbivores start to begin their long-term four and a half million year decline. Um, I should also note this decline kicks in about two and a half million years before we even have any archaeological evidence for human um, involvement with big mega herbivore species in the form of uh, butchery sites. You find an elephant skeleton with uh, stone tools and butchery marks on it. Um, and that antiquity of the decline, uh, I think to most people, would eliminate human impacts as, as the, the ultimate cause for setting it in motion. Um, if we look at, for example, Artipithecus, who's around when things really get going, um, Artipithecus is a, is a small-bodied hominin. It's known from a few fossil sites in Ethiopia. Uh, it's it, you know, maybe 80 pounds body mass, chimpanzee size um, brains. They're not using stone tools. They are capable of bipedal locomotion, though they're still spending a lot of time in the trees. Um, no one is going to make the case that little Artipithecus here is going to be hunting and ultimately driving to extinction those elephants in the background. That is, it is not an option. Um, so, so what's going on? What are our possibilities here? Um, if we look over uh, the same time frame, um, atmospheric CO2 concentrations are declining over the last five million years. It matches very nicely that mega herbivore decline, um, though it's not a direct cause effect um, link. But what we think is going on is the influence of atmospheric CO2 on vegetation structure. And in particular, as you lower atmospheric CO2 concentrations, that's going to favor uh, tropical grasses. And, and uh, you know, the savanna grasslands, these grassy habitats teeming with zebras and wildebeest that you might picture, you know, think uh, of sort of a stereotypical Eastern African environment today, that did not exist four million years ago, six million years ago. Um, but as, as globally as CO2 concentrations began to drop, these grasslands began to ex expand. And we see evidence of that um, in, in the geological record from the same sites where we're getting these fossil uh, mega herbivore assemblages. Um, this is showing uh, each of those dots is a sample of a soil carbonate where we can measure uh, stable carbon isotopes and get an idea of what the vegetation structure looked like. Um, values at the bottom end of the screen indicate woodlands and forests, and those higher up on the screen indicate grasslands. And uh, over the same time period where mega herbivores are declining, grasslands are expanding across eastern Africa. And this is a, a very well-documented phenomenon. And that decline is almost certainly, uh, the expansion of grasslands and decline of woodlands and forests is almost certainly related to CO2. Like I said, there's this cause-effect relationship here. CO2 goes down, tropical grasslands expand. 
Um, and we can, we can dig further into this. Uh, the mega herbivores that become extinct, about three quarters of them, in terms of the foods they ate and the habitats that they lived in, uh, three quarters of these mega herbivores uh, relied on trees and shrubs. And we know that from paleodietary evidence. We can look at uh, stable carbon isotopes from their teeth, and that'll tell us uh, whether they're eating grasses or if they're eating leaves from trees and shrubs. Most of the uh, extinct mega herbivores needed trees and shrubs. And those trees and shrubs are, are declining in availability as grasslands are expanding. Uh, you might say, hey, you're showing me a picture of an elephant eating leaves from a, a tree. Um, from that same isotopic evidence, we actually know that elephants spent most of their history eating grasses. And that's probably the only reason that they survived this long-term decline. And it's only relatively recently, we haven't really figured out when, um, that elephants have shifted their diet and, began, and, and started eating a lot more leafy vegetation and spending more time in wooded environments. Some people even suspect that's because of uh, human impacts, perhaps in the last few tens of thousands of years. The elephant's saying, we'll go over here in the forest, you guys can be out here, um, we'll all be happy for a while. Um, so, so in summary here, uh, I think there's strong evidence that uh, long-term grassland expansion not necessarily hominin impacts at all, uh, was the primary driver of African mega herbivore extinctions. We have these, uh, you know, diversity of elephants and elephant-like animals, other mega herbivores that lived in these wooded environments. Long-term climatic changes caused those woodlands to, to shrink. Grasslands were expanding. And as, as their food source disappears, so too did the mega herbivores. So did ancient hominin impacts trigger the demise of Africa's mega herbivores? I'm going to say no way. Um, and with that, I, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Probably not. So the question was, did Homo erectus have uh, projectile weaponry? Um, it's hard to say. The diagnostic uh, archaeological signature, we see a big archaeological transition around the same time that Homo erectus shows up. And it's these big hand axes. They're called the Shulian hand axes. Um, they're usually about yay long, and they're big clunky things um, pointed at one, one end and sort of uh, it'll fit in the, base, your, the palm of your hand. Um, they could have had projectile technology. Uh, you, on organic remains, but we just have no evidence of it. Um, but the oldest, there's a site in Germany, not in Africa, but there's a German site that has uh, preserved spectacular organic remains, and there's evidence of spears at, I think, about 400 to 500,000 years or so, uh, wooden spears that preserved, but um, that's not Homo erectus. And, uh, it's, it would be its successor. Um, so probably not. I don't think so. Yeah, so the question was, uh, do we have any idea of when the atlatl or spear thrower emerged in the archaeological record? Atlatls are like those things that uh, if you have a pet dog, um, it's, it's that extension of your arm and you, you go you know, throw tennis balls 100 a, a yards with them. Um, it's basically the equivalent of that. And uh, you mount a spear at the end instead of a tennis ball. And instead of throwing it at your dog, you throw it at um, whatever you want to have for dinner. Um, those, uh, we see evidence. Um, in the Upper Paleolithic of Europe, so after about 40,000 years is, yeah. So I'm looking at the carbon dioxide levels increases, O2 levels increase, correct? Is, is the atmosphere tracking that track? I don't think atmospheric oxygen is directly tracking that. Yeah, and it, it's, it's not just a, a, a plant size issue. There's a couple of factors that, that are in play. Uh, but the tropical grasses uh, have a different pathway of photosynthesis compared to trees and shrubs. And that, the, um, that pathway, that way of converting sunlight into energy, is more efficient at lower CO2. 
um, and that gives tropical grasses the advantage. And the other way of photosynthesizing is, is less efficient at low CO2. The other issue at the same time is when atmospheric CO2 starts to decline, um, I mean, plants love CO2. They need it as part of s photosynthesis. And when it declines, that sort of slows down cr plant growth a little bit. And that means things like uh, fire can be more effective. So for example, you set fire to a landscape, clear out the trees and shrubs, uh, the grasses will grow, um, but it will take, at lower CO2, it will take longer for the trees and shrubs to get established again. And if another fire goes through, it's going to happen before they ever get established at all. So it's, a, it's sort of these multiple feedbacks that facilitate grassland expansion as CO2 declines. Yeah. I think we've seen extensively in North, North America. Mm -hmm. So uh, I that's, that's a really interesting question. It's actually something I'm working on in, in South Africa, where I'm heading tomorrow, um, to, to address in part. Um, so, so we know from ethnographic observations, but also paleo observations, um, that hunter-gatherers will set fire to the landscape because it, it'll stimulate fresh growth, it attracts game. Um, and it, you know, it, it enhances your returns as a hunter on any part of the landscape. Um, the antiquity of that kind of behavior is really hard to get at. Um, there, there are some, you know, it, it, this goes into a much bigger debate about when our human ancestors began to control fire. Some people, the, the earliest rock solid evidence is something like 780,000 years. Um, there's some sort of hints at earlier fire use, maybe going back to about one and a half million, um, if not a little bit longer. But it's sort of, it's sort of iffy. But our, our understanding of when people were really using fire to uh, transform the landscape as a foraging tool, um, I mean, Native Americans did it here in the U.S. They, they possibly have been as long as they've been here. Um, in terms of the, the depth in our evolutionary history, we don't know yet. Yes. Uh, I recall in the sugar that the elephant population there, when the sugar crops were too high, uh, would be destroying the trees to prevent them from age. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of burning grassland, what happened is they became a low brushland, almost like a chaparral. Yep. Almost, uh, it was almost uh, yeah, so, so super high densities of elephants, I mean, that, that the phenomenon that's going on in Kruger is, is part of this issue of, of basically stocking densities are too high, and it's in part because the elephants don't want to go anywhere else. Um, and so you get these sort of unusually high densities of elephants in the same place, and there have been similar situations elsewhere in southern Africa where they end up having to cull them, but it's because they're not, they're not leaving the park boundaries. Um, the, but the effects, uh, so that is something that super high densities of elephants will sort of convert woodlands into sort of these shrubby habitats that aren't necessarily ideal. Um, but different mega herbivore species do different things depending on their diets and feeding ecology. So like uh, white rhinos, which are grazers eating grass, they'll actually promote grassland expansion through their, their feeding activity. Um, they, can, they can even uh, alter fire regimes in a way that again promote grasses. So the, we have these different mechanisms working in different ways. What the, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting problem is is what did these ecosystems look like four million years ago when we had all these different mega herbivores? Because in terms of um, you know, what vegetation structure looks like, it's influenced by climate, but it's also influenced by the herbivores. And the scales may have been very different that deep in the past when you have this incredible diversity of mega herbivores. But what's going on uh, remains to be disentangled a bit. Yeah, um, so let me clarify. So when I said sort of mega herbivores hanging out in groups side by side, I, I meant sort of uh, they're sympatric. They're sharing the same sort of ecosystems, but that they probably were interacting on some level. Um, 
we do have conservation issues where closely related species will, uh, if they are sort of all forced in the same nature reserve, begin interbreeding. And instead of having two species, we end up with sort of one hybrid. Um, the extent to which that's happening in the past is hard to get at, but, uh, you know, for example, elephant proboscidean diversity, the diversity of the elephant f elephants and their relatives, um, was massive, say, six million years ago across the entire continent. There's more than a dozen species. Um, I imagine that kind of phenomenon is not going to be happening too much just because we have this in, in large diversity, but we still are finding at the same fossil sites, uh, you know, not just one elephant species, but two, three, four, a along with, uh, you know, a couple of giraffes and, and different types, n not just one hippo, but three or four types of hippos, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've also been involved in some work on the extinctions here. Uh, there's not a direct relationship, but it has changed the way that I've sort of thought about the North American extinctions in the sense that, um, I mean, this, the long-term pattern uh, in Africa, it just it makes sense. It is so easy to explain in terms of, uh, of climate-driven environmental change. And, and so far, we, we published some of this work a little more than a year ago. No one's told me I'm full of it, which is rare. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think it means we're, we're onto something, um, but Africa makes sense, and even more recent extinctions in the last, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on extinctions that are similar in time to what's happening in North America. It's easy. It's, it's these big specialized grazers disappearing from certain parts of Africa when their habitats are disappearing. In, in North America, though, the, the diversity of animals that disappeared in the last 15,000 years, it's incredible. Um, it's not just, you know, the, the animals that ate grass in the open grassy habitats that disappeared, it's animals that lived everywhere and ate everything and the things that were eating them. And, and there, is no, there are a lot of archaeologists who take issue with this overkill hypothesis, the idea that Native Americans showed up and started driving everything to extinction. Um, it's easy to try to poke holes in that argument. On the other hand, nobody has come up with a very good um, alternative explanation. Uh, I mean, it's easy to say climate change, but what kind of climate change is, is going to just sort of eliminate everything from all sorts of habitats? And, and so the more I think about Africa, the, the harder it is for me to understand what happened in North, uh, North America and many other places without invoking human <laughs> impacts. Yeah, so I think humans probably were very important here uh, because what? we... What? Hey. I got here. <laughs> you made it, thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there widespread open grassy habitats are relatively recent. I mean, when we're talking about paleogene time scales. But there's also, uh, so I, I think I mentioned a few times that we saw the expansion of tropical grasses. There's another, there are temperate grass species um, that actually use the same photosynthetic pathway as trees and shrubs. Um, but they're cool season grasses. You find them at high latitudes or high altitudes. Um, those would have been around. Um, in certain places. They wouldn't have been around in the tropics so much just because it's too warm there for those species to grow. But So grasses do have a more ancient history in, in some parts of the world, but the sort of typical, um, you know, this kind of scene in the tropics, you were, you're not going to see that until the last few million years. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you.